Thanks. Appreciate it, Greg. Should I put this over here? Can you all hear me? Thank you, Greg. We in? We on? Cool. Hey, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of things you could be doing in LA today, but you're here uh, for this talk, and I really appreciate it. It's my second word camp uh, that I've spoken at, so I'm, I'm super stoked. Um, you have instantly become my new BFFs. I'm kind of new at emojis, so, so don't judge me. Um, so you're here today to listen to a talk about showing off the art of the portfolio. Um, I'm hoping to go over some guidelines and give you some definitions of what makes a good portfolio and look at some best-in-class examples. Um, so that's what we're going to get into. Before I talk about a topic, I usually like to define what it is I'm going to talk about. So since it's the art of the portfolio, um, let's talk about art. Uh, David Hockney says this very relevant quote, art has, has to move you and design does not, unless it's good design for a bus. Um, so it's kind of tongue in cheek. The point being is that uh, you can design a portfolio, but if it doesn't move you, if it doesn't have something special behind it, you, you might miss the boat and we don't want you to do that. Um, to move forward, why do we uh, call our portfolios portfolios? Where does that come from? It's kind of interesting. Um, it's a word that came around the 18th century in Italy. Uh, any Italians in here might butch kill me for butchering this word, but portafoglio, okay? So it's a combination of poter and folium, so to carry sheets. Um, why this is significant? So 18th century, you're starting graphic design, you're starting illustration. This is the time these industries uh, happened. Uh, the great uh, typographer Bodini's from that time. Uh, Toulouse-Lautrec might have been carrying his portfolio around to get work in France. So the word portfolio is rooted in our, um, our industry. So it's important we're, we're good at it. Um, I think without any scientific data, we can all agree that your portfolio of your work is maybe the number one most important thing um, you have. And, and you, you kind of live and die by that. So lots of times I'll go to an agency's website or an artist's website, and in three seconds, my jaw has hit the laptop. I am just in awe, my heart's beating fast. I've fallen in love with, with um, the person's work, and they've, they've captured me. Show of hands, how many people have ever had this feeling? Good, I was hoping that would happen, so we're all on the same page. Yeah, that's called love of first sight, and that's, that's, that's important, it's that first impression. Um, Chip Kidd says uh, very well that you should be clear when you need people to understand you immediately, and as we know in the web world, immediately is like three seconds that someone's gonna be on your website before they click somewhere else. You need them to fall in love, at least that's the bar we're trying to set for ourselves. Um, here are six common similarities that I've noticed the great portfolios. Not all great portfolios have these, and you guys might find more, but these are just six that I've, I've observed. Um, one, they describe their client and their client's needs. Uh, two, they describe what they did to solve the client's problems. Three, they share the, their process. Four, they present their work in an impressive way. Five, they often have a testimonial. Not always, but most of them do. And six, they borrow, don't steal, from their idols. And that's, that's a really important thing. You need inspiration. You need to look for people you, you admire. You put all these things together, these six things, and, and what do you come up with? You come up with a case study. Um, basically, after you um, kind of combine all these, these elements. When you put a bunch of case studies together, you have a portfolio. So this is, uh, this is, how, this is what we're kind of putting together to get that. So here are the eight steps that I've put together to building a solid case study. Um, step number one, you need to stay organized. I think this is the most valuable thing because when it comes to building a case study, it's a lot of work. And the last thing you want to be doing is trudging around looking for uh, folders and things of, of where your work was. Um, Mark here says really well in this quote that no matter what your job description is, you need a reliable and robust system for note taking. And this mature process for managing the information will help you throughout your career. So always kind of have a process going. Just real quick, here's, here's some, uh, I like colors, so I set up my folders and colors. And so for this client I worked with just recently, I, uh, I have everything in folders and I know where that is and that's consistent through all my projects. So I'm ready to build my case study, I know where to look. Uh, so that's step number one, stay organized. Step number two, ask yourself the question, what kind of work do I want to be hired to do? And show that type of work. That's really important. Um, if you're a UI, UX designer, show wireframes. If you, uh, or show, show flowcharts. Show how you go from one, one screen to the next and how you've solved those kind of problems. Show sitemaps. Um, if you're a visual or branding designer, 
Uh, show logos or icons. You better have a lot of this in your portfolio if, you, if you're a visual designer. Show that you know how to make a style guide. Uh, show how those logos and icons you've made have been applied to real world things like websites or apps or t-shirts or, or maybe vans. Uh, if you're a developer, talk about the technology you used. If you can combine WordPress and WooCommerce and make a responsive site, you should mention that. That's really valuable stuff to know. Maybe you made a really cool dashboard for your client so they can track users' purchases and stuff and their WordPress dashboard's all custom. You want to point that out. That's a really important thing to show. Um, show the results you've created, the analytics uh, increasing, the SEO gains, you know, those use charts. This may look boring to some people, but for a potential client who wants to hire you, they want to know those things. Show them how they can uh, get their best return on investment. At, in essence, show that you can solve problems and you'll show that you're worth hiring. That's, that's the bottom line. So step number three, you got to find your idols and you got to take notes. Um, find the best in class out there. List your favorite examples. These are some of my favorite examples. I love uh, Focus Lab and PowerVol, uh, Urban Influence, John Contino, uh, Jessica Hish. These are people who I, I idolize. I think they're amazing artists. Uh, highlight the specific uh, qualities you're attracted to. So uh, for example, Urban Influence has this page showing wireframes that they did. And I think this is so cool. So what I did is screenshot it. And then I keep it in my folder and say, when I build my portfolio, I look back on these, these pieces of influence. Um, Identify similarities in your own work. So again, for an example, Jessica Hish on the left here did this redesign of a uh, logo for MailChimp. And she did these little red dots to show kind of improvements she made, the new logos in the blue and the old logos in the gray. And it really shows her process and what she did. So I thought to myself, hey, I redid a logo last summer for a, a nonprofit. And this one over here, this badge had a bunch of stuff in it. And I reduced it. So I sort of borrowed, not stole, borrowed her technique to show um, the creative process. And that's, again, finding similarities in your own work and how you, can, how you can find inspiration for that. Step four, start writing. I know a lot of us aren't writers. Maybe some of us are, but most of us are designers, developers. So I always say to get the writing done out the gate, because this is the hard part. You don't want to wait till the last minute to write. It will, it will stump you. Um, if you can't remember what to write, Remember what Sim Yosemite Sam says when someone like upsets him. He's like, who, what, where, how, why? You basically want to tell the story about what you did. Define who hired you and what they did to or, and why they hired you. Why did they need the, the what did you do to get the problem solved? Um, so this is sort of like Mad Libs. And, and you could, this is a very generic outline of, of, of what you could do to write about your client. So um, can someone give me the name of a company that everybody uses their product of? Very generic. Anybody? Apple. Apple. Great. OK. This is, this is, thank you. That was easy. So you could, you could fill this out. Apple makes the best uh, computers in the world. Uh, with business uh, rising, it was time for a new website to, to refresh and help the business grow. And knowing the current website was outdated, Visual Rhythm, uh, focused on updating uh, Apple's uh, website user interface and uh, visual design. You, again, you're just, you're just sort of getting a thesis down for what you're about to talk about. Uh, explain what you did and how you did it. So using my UX UI design skills, my visual design skills, my branding design skills, the result was an updated website, which included um, an easier shopping cart checkout and an a easier catalog to, to view um, and a, an updated website. As a result, Apple's totally stoked because their new website has grown business by a billion dollars in a month. So, you get the idea. You could, this is, it, a lot of websites and, and case studies kind of, kind of look like this. And this is just, again, you can wax poetic a little bit more than what we've done here. Um, so you want to write about your, your process, or write about uh, in the case study. Step number five, you want to show your process. Show how you work. Um, you can show screenshots. I took the screenshot of a mood board. This is, shows you a lot about the process that went into making this logo. And again, I'm just taking a picture of my iPhone of my, my screen of a mood board. Um, I, I pulled this off a dribble. This is of some wireframes uh, a UX designer was working on. And again, it's not too detailed, but you can see their process and their thinking and the kind of work that they do. Um, you can show sketches. Uh, this is a branding or a logo I did. Um, and this is, again, showing the sketches just to show the thought process and kind of like what you go through and how you achieve a final product. Um, how do you go from pen to pixels? You know, this is a wireframe I had designed for a website, and then how this kind of like ended up actually really translating into what the page looked like. Um, 
wireframes uh, or something else, you could show more in a high fidelity stance, like uh, showing how a process goes, like on a contact form, going from step one to step five and how you solve that problem for a client. Or show how you've solved a responsive design problem. Um, but sharing your process is valuable because it shows how you work, it shows how you think, and it shows that you know how to take an idea from concept to finished product. Um, so we're up to step six. Uh, show the final product. This is really important, and I mean show the whole brand, the whole website, the whole app. Nothing pains me more than when I go to a website and someone's a brilliant developer or designer and I met them at WordCamp and I go to their portfolio and there's a picture of a website, I think, on a picture of a, a desktop and you click the thing and it's a bigger picture of that same graphic that says I made this website and there's no, there's no insight into what they did. Um, Hopefully, your website or app is much more than the landing page above the fold. That's not the best part of your website. There's tons of great work in there. Um, so when you show websites or apps on multiple, or show them on multiple devices, and show full page designs. You know, this is uh, the same page of a website I did for the California Dance Network. And on a phone, we decided to reduce uh, the design and not show images. It's just you know, show, show how these different things translate. Show the whole page design. Um, go big, because no one ever say go small or go home. You have big screens now. Everybody's looking on your portfolio on a 27-inch monitor. This is your chance to really show the feeling of these websites, how big this really feels. They might not click on the link to the website. This is your chance to show them how, how this really looks. Um, show examples of the websites and apps in a, quote, real environment. Um, again, this kind of gives a more emotional feeling of how this website or app might look to someone in the real world. Um, when you have a logo or brands, show style guides. Don't just show the logo. Show how the logo is used. Show how it looked on t-shirts. Show how it looks in a, how the color palette you made looks. Um, the, the, the text and the typography you used to, to match with it. You can do a lot with little. Um, if you need to take pictures of stuff and you're an amateur photographer and you're not married to a photographer, you can use your iPhone. And, and, and the, the poor man's way of doing this is, is to take a photo of something in gray light, which means where the shadow of a building hits, it's like a 40% light. There's a lot of Google stuff about this. But the point is these photos are all taken on an iPhone and they look okay. They're, they're okay for your portfolio. Uh, defy the budget and bulk up your portfolio. And what I mean by this is not everybody can afford a van wrap or the notebooks you suggested that they should get or maybe your client lost all the clothing tags you ordered for them. You know what? You can make this stuff. It's, it's, it's Photoshop. You're a designer. You know how to do this. That's okay. Um, there's a lot of resources for this stuff online. Sidecar is a great one. Uh, Creative Market, Pixton. And the point is we're trying to show off. We're trying to show our work in the best light. So use these resources. You can Google this stuff. MacBook Photoshop mock-up. You'll be surprised with I me. Mean, there's, there's literally millions of things out there to show your work in the best light. Um, basically, you get blanks like this, and, and you can put your website in there. Is that cheating? No. Am I good at taking a picture at, of my laptop with an iPhone? Maybe, but this looks better, and that's okay, and lots of people do this. Um, the tips I give for using this kind of stock art is use a variety of sources, because you don't want to look like everybody else. You don't want everybody to have the same free stuff, um, and be creative with it. And you can make a lot from a little. Um, you, you know, be, be less is more. Basically, you know, just use, use your, choose wisely. Um, if you have a bundle of stuff, like a bundle of, of logos or, or stationery or, or just different things you've done, uh, bundle them together. Don't let old work die. It might be good. It's, it's, not, it's not worth going away. What I mean by this is, uh, this is John Contino. I mentioned him earlier. Um, these are t-shirts that he's made. And uh, all these, uh, you kind of notice some of the shadows here and some of the t-shirts look really similar, huh? He probably um, had all these printed, but it was more effective for him to show in his portfolio uh, how this looks here, rather than taking a picture of every single one. And, and it's a nice way to bundle these t-shirts together, which are generally like one-offs in his portfolio. Your seventh step is to ask for a testimonial. Uh, this, this looks great in your portfolio. I always recommend doing it during the launch celebration period. Hey, Andrew, the website looks great. Hey, Joe, that's awesome. Why don't you write a testimonial about how great it was? This is kind of the buzz time. It's a great time to go for that. Um, sometimes you need to expedite the delivery, because even, even the best intentions of a client will be like, yeah, Andrew, I'll get you a testimonial. And it's three months later, and you have a WordCamp coming up, and you need a testimonial by Friday. You can say to them, hey, Joe, um, you know, if you could give me a testimonial by Friday, and I know you're already agreeing to write one. Again, I'm not paying you to write me a testimonial, but if you could kind of nudge it along, I could give you 50 bucks off your next thing you do with me. And they'll often do it and tell you to keep the 50 bucks, but that works. 
Um, show them examples. If your client's not a great writer, it's really valuable to show them some examples of other testimonials people have written for you. Get their creative juices rolling. Um, these are testimonials I've received um, for my clients. And, and I think the feedback here is, it's not only is it insanely flattering, but I learned a lot about what my client felt about the experience of working with me. And that's, that's really good feedback, if for nothing else. Um, the eighth step, final step, build your portfolio. You have all these pieces together. So, so build your portfolio, build your case studies, and build them into your portfolio. If you're a developer, code it. Show how good you are coding. This is your chance to show off. If you're a designer slash developer, there's tons of WordPress themes. We all know that. That will, that will show your portfolio in a great light. Um, you can also just use Behance. If you're just a designer and you don't want to code and you don't know how, you can do a lot with what's out there for free in, in the Behance world. Uh, the main things, though, to keep in mind, keep your portfolio easy to navigate and make it easy for people to contact you. At some point, they're going to go, oh, and their jaw's going to drop, and they're going to say, you, that guy or girl, that's who I want to hire. And so make it easy for them to click that rotary phone and get in touch with you. Uh, always keep quality over quantity. This is really important. A uh, lot of portfolios generally that I've seen, and again, I'm not saying everything, are between about 9 and 16 case studies. That's an average. I might be wrong sometimes, but that's about it. My point is, if between 9 and 16 case studies, you're going to get your point across. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of case studies. And you know, about halfway through, someone's going to say yes, that's or, or no. Um, if you're a, a big agency or an illustrator, photographer, they generally have more than that. Um, this is my review of the eight steps, uh, just really quickly to go over. Stay organized. Uh, ask yourself what kind of work you want to do. Find your idols. Take notes. Start writing about what you did. Share your process. Show the final product. Um, ask for a testimonial. And then build your case study. Always keep your social media stuff updated. If you're not on LinkedIn or Facebook, that's OK. Whatever ones you are on, just keep those ones updated. But the point is, you know, this habit of updating your portfolio all the time makes you always look your best. You always have that chance to look your best, and you always have the chance to create a memorable first impression. And that's what we're going for. Um, remember that building a portfolio is a marathon. It's not a sprint. You're going to do this over and over and over again in your career. It's never going to be your last portfolio, because your last portfolio is going to look three years old. You have to always do this. Um, Want to see some of my favorites? Mm -hmm. Stuff I like? Yeah. Okay, cool. It, this is subject to change. It changes every three months. I, I like different stuff. It's like, it's like music, styles change. Um, this is an example of a Behance uh, site. I can't remember this person's name because it's off the screen and that's terrible, but, but my point is to look at their case study that they've built just in Behance using this. Uh, it's an it's a app for your inbox. And again, this, this person didn't code this. These are just flat JPEGs, and you really get a sense of all the work that went into this and all the different screens and stuff they did and it just it's a really nice way of, of presenting this um, and at the bottom people can leave you comments and tell you how good of a job you did um, Joshua Crone is a crone I'm probably saying his name wrong he is a designer for focus lab um, I really like this page in his website uh, I believe this is for a contracting firm he shows some alternative logos he did some stationery. T-shirts, again, has some of those suspicious shadows. But that's OK. That's OK. The point is that he shows how his work is applied, and that's important. I mean, that's what, it doesn't take away from anything in the design. Um, it, shows, it shows how the work looks when it is applied. It's a beautiful shot of the website, how it looks on different devices. Um, this is my, my hero, John Contino. He did this can for Miller High Life recently. Looks so cool. Here's some illustrations that he uh, ads to show his part of his process, the impact the thing had on social media, how cool it looks on a leather jacket, um, some of his original sketches. He's sharing his process with us again and showing us what he did. And then the final product kind of all comes together. This is Focus Lab's website. Um, they did this uh, case study for uh, Caddy Skelton. This is an interior designer, I believe. Again, a great uh, summary at the top of what they did and how they did it. Uh, they're really cool about how they show their marks and their early explorations of uh, explorations of logos, their icon sets, some typography, um, the color systems they chose. There's a missing image. I'm sorry. Um, how the uh, brand was applied in the real world, and the website design, and a quote at the bottom about how great they did. Uh, Paraval, love 
Paraval. Check out their work. They're incredible. Uh, this is a uh, case study they did for Retail Me Not. Um, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like Groupon, right? I guess I don't really use Retail Me Not, but um, the point is they show the work they did, the before and after. This is a really cool feature. This animated GIF of the logo and how they've improved it. Um, icons they used. Uh, branding style guides. I l really like how on their iPhones here they chose not to use like an iPhone 3 or iPhone 4. That could look out of date. So instead they were smart and said, ah, oh, why don't we use these illustrations? This will always kind of look up to date. And that's maybe something to think about when you're putting your portfolio together. It's smart, smart planning. They show some of their sketches. Um, Urban Influence is an uh, agency up in Seattle. Uh, this is a, a website they built. I believe this is a furniture. Uh, company. Um, they show the site map. This is a really, really thorough case study. They show uh, how they studied the people and the, the users and what, what was important to the, you know, the customers who were going to be on the website and how that affected their design. There are those wireframes. I bet you didn't know they moved, huh? That's pretty cool. Um, the design of the, the site. Again, this is one of those ones I came to in like three, I said, I want to be this. I want to be this so bad. And so you, you, you look and collect all these heroes and, and sort of, and just get inspired all over the place. Um, it goes on and on and on. It's so great, it's almost painful. Um, so I uh, just wanted, because I have the opportunity to share with you a couple of my case studies I've built recently after doing some of my digging um, and some of my heroes. This is uh, Todd Davis. He's an architect up in San Francisco. He's Recently had a lot of press. You can vote for him in Home Garden Network this month as like a top architect. He's on TV. It's pretty cool. Um, these are some discovery sketches we did for his logo and his brand, how it ended up looking, um, how it looks in the wild. There's that pesky notebook again. But man, it looks OK. The cards are real. Um, it doesn't matter, though. Again, that doesn't matter. Uh, postcards we did for him. He was in Dwell Magazine, how the website looked. Um, Here's just different examples of how it looks on different devices. And Todd gave me a really, really slamming quote, which I appreciated. He has a great picture. He's a good looking guy. Um, this is a page I put together of uh, logos and designs I've done since Photoshop 3. Maybe not that old, but you know, just, just a few years old. And these are kind of like one-offs and stuff. And I got to compile all my logos and icons just on a page. Again. Uh, just a, a nice way of kind of combining everything and showing an area in your portfolio that's just a case study of just a specific kind of work that you do. That's, a, that's always a nice thing to show. Um, so those are my, those are my examples. Um, I just want to keep everybody uh, uh, just to remember that every job is an opportunity to do your very best work. And this comic from Calvin and Hobbes always reminds me of this. Whenever he made a snowman, he went for it. He didn't just like make a snowman. He did the best snowman he could possibly do. So every time you get a chance to do a job, even if it's a low budget, you can make a lot out of that. You can make a great case study, and your, your portfolio will really shine from it. Um, so my name is Andrew Bergeron. As Greg mentioned, I run Visual Rhythm. I'm a web branding UI UX designer down in San Diego. You can find me at visualrhythm.com or Visual Rhythm on any of those things. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? I'll go right there. Sure. Right. So the question was, if you have older work and you want to uh, show it to a certain type of client, but you kind of don't want to, I guess, put it in the file cabinet and not bring it to the front, is that the question? Right. Yeah. Um, I would mention. I would. You know, it's kind of like that bundling thing. You know, maybe it's, uh, I've heard like Urban Influence has a great page called Odds and Ends. And again, these are like stationary and stuff that they've worked on in the past. And also, sometimes you have to cater your portfolio to who you're sending it to. You know, if you're looking for a job at a specific agency or a specific thing, and they want to see a specific thing, go ahead and dust off some of that old stuff and bring it in. And again, I would I would recommend putting it in a collection. If that answers the question, I'll go right behind back there. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for the presentation. Thank you. So, um, okay. So Yeah. But I like the part, I just got some visual like, 
Right, besides like your notepad and your moleskin and sketching, which is cool though, because people want to see that. And I think a lot of showing that we're humans behind all of this is really... That's fine. My notes are terrible. I mean, my, my sketches is, is it, you know, I, I, I shake when I write. It's ridiculous. But, but, but um, yeah, I, I think, you know, one thing you should definitely show is how your content and the writing you did has helped the client's bottom line. You know, there's a lot of, like, graphs and charts out there, and it doesn't have to be scientific, but, you know, since I wrote for client XYZ, they've sold a thousand more bee catchers or whatever it is that you've done. And, and show, show visuals in that sense of, of how you've helped them achieve those goals, if that, if that helps Yeah. Make it up. Uh, the question was if you if you if you have wanted to do work, basically, so let's say you're applying for a job and you've never done UX product design. So the question is, yeah. So if you've never done the work and you, you how do you um, how do you show work you've never done? I've seen in a lot of portfolios of people who are really good designers and developers out there. They will take something like a like a Redbox, for example, where we rent movies, and they say, here's my how I would redo Redbox. They weren't really hired by Redbox, but they showed how they would take that concept to end and do that in their portfolio. And I can tell you for a fact that's landed them jobs. So it takes the extra homework, and you're not getting paid for it on the side, but the payoff's there, and you might learn something even from doing it. No, not at all. I mean, no, it doesn't. As long as you're admitting, I mean, you're not like lying and saying, I got a job for Redbox. You're saying, here's my concept. And I think a lot of people you're even applying for are flattered that you would take the time to look at their own product and how, like, how I would redo the WordPress dashboard might be something Matt Mullenweg would be really interested in seeing, especially if you have a great idea. He might yell at his team, say, why don't you guys think of this? But, um, over here, yeah. Oh, that's, that's dribble. That's for, um, that's for us designer folks, so there are a lot of different people around it. It's called D-R-I-B-B-B-L-E. Abby, what's your take on when you're designing a layout, whether it's going to be used landscape or more than one portion? Do you mean like for responsive design? Yes. You know, if you scale up like for vertical or for horizontal. Yeah. Right? Like a new type of landscape, so when somebody looks at it on a, on a portrait, like a whole, right. So the question is, how do you how do you account for landscape versus uh, portrait mode on on mobile? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's challenging. You know, I mean, whenever I do my process, whenever I'm doing wireframes, I, I start with with uh, mobile. I design mobile first, um, just as a practice, and so I kind of get that out of the way and, and make sure I'm, I'm making that impact, knowing that if it impacts on mobile, it's probably going to look great on a desktop. So my 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 scaling points are more or less a tablet, portrait size, and then um, everything down from that, and then kind of desktop. Yeah, I do, I, do, I do portrait down, and if it's a tablet horizontal, it's going to often get the desktop view. That's just kind of my practice, but that's not always true. Well, if it's on a photographer, that's a killer, whether it's landscape. Oh, yeah. Maybe put a graphic on there, suggest it. Be like, this looks best, turn this way. Because I, for, for photography, you're right. You want that. That's, I was going to say, the only time I ever turn and pad is when I'm looking at photos. And you want to swipe. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Oh, I'll take that one way in the back. I like your taste, and I like your approach. Thank you very much. It, so the question is, I'm a UX UI guy. What are my favorite tools? You, do you mean as far as like applications I use and that sort of thing? Yeah. Where do you get inspiration for that? Oh, I see. Okay. Well, I, I use Sketch. I've been using that a lot. I've recently divorced uh, Fireworks, which I miss, but that's okay. Um, I use Sketch for that. Um, I go on Dribble a lot and Behance a lot, um, and and those those sort of things. I'm trying to think of what other uh, resources. It seems like I'm always coming across it. I'm kind of a digger, you know. I'll go on Behance and type in uh, "best UI or wireframes 2015" and just kind of see what's out there. Um, again, and I also look. At, I'm a big fanboy of, of agencies and, and art and those kind of things, so I'll look to see like who's who's the best in class out there. Um, you could type in "best agencies San Diego," "best agencies LA," and you're gonna come up with a bunch of different great examples to look at. Cool. Am I good? I'm out of time. This is end. The clock says end. Do I, have, do I have time for one more question? Is that okay? I think I saw a hand back there. I'm not sure. Or, okay, yeah. Oh, sorry. Can we get your slides? Yeah, totally. Um, yes. 
I, I, I guess I can put them online, or um, yeah, I'll just I can I can even email you the PDF of it. Well, slides.com. I, I yeah I put them up on a different one I can't remember slides.com but one of those but thank you yeah yeah totally. Are you talking about this one? No, the, well, this is great that you landed on that for a few. The one earlier, when it was before you kind of started, and it was like, here are six things I think this is great. All right. You guys getting dizzy yet? <laughs> that was 102 slides. You were very patient, so I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. So Thanks. Wow. Should I pose it? Cool. <laughs> Available for modeling. <laughs> the slide that had the first um, like template for what you would have in a portfolio, like where you filled in Apple, like client. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, no, no problem. Oops. It's coming. Fine. Oh, here we go. Yes. We're doing the, the Mad Libs thing. Yeah. Thanks for saying Apple, by the way. I thought you were going to say like, Vaughn Supermarket. That's what my <laughs> wife said to me the other day, which kind of put me on the spot. Okay. Is that the first one? That's the first one. The this is the second one. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate that, man. Yeah, cheers. Yeah.